Ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to a special edition of the Football Insomniac. I'm your host, Colin Watt, and I'm delighted to be joined today by a very special guest. He is a Champions League winner, a two-time Hall of Famer at both Norwich City and the Scottish Hall of Fame. It is Mr Lambo himself, Paul Lambert. How are you doing, Paul? I'm alright. I'm, uh, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the... I'm enjoying everything at the minute, so I've got no no problems anywhere. And we were just discussing before we came on air, it's, we're recording this just as the lockdown restrictions are easing and we're hoping that over the next couple of months or so we'll start seeing fans back in football and life returning to a bit of normality. Well, I think that's important for sport in general. I think general sport needs the needs fans because without it you don't really have a, have a sport really. It's a different game where it be football, golf, tennis, rugby. You, you need an adrenaline rush from the support and I'm pretty sure all major sports that play, they, they need the fans in, especially football because it's, it's an emotional game and I think they, it certainly will be more welcome when, they, when everybody does come back. And over the course of this interview, we're going to touch a lot on Paul's career, both um, his club career and also his management career, and also his time as part of the Scottish national team. As I mentioned previously, he is a Scottish Hall of Famer, um, and that's an incredible achievement. Uh, Paul, you obviously you were inducted into the Hall of Fame. That must have kind of been special for you when you found out that was going to happen. I think the, the, when you get the kind of accolades, it's always, it's always nice, but you also... Played in good teams that helped, and I played with some really great players that helped me along that along that pathway. And when you get an induction, it's always an honour to get in. And being from Scotland, which is not a lot a lot of population or a massive country by any stretch, and um, the players are probably that have followed in here as well, which have been which, which have been great. And um, yeah, from from getting it from your own country is a special thing. I think that's that's the beauty of it. I mean, it's your own country. I think it it means an awful lot to you. And we're going to discuss the kind of pathway to you actually getting into the Hall of Fame, and it starts a way back as a young lad growing up in the small town of Linwood. What was mm. that experience like? We always part of the school team. We always kind of playing football as much as you could. Yeah, well, I was I was actually born in Duke Street, just a stone's throw away from from Celtic Park. And, my mum and dad were, were uh, living in Domarnock, just around the corner from Parkhead. So, uh, and then we moved out to Limwood when we were younger. Because in, in those days, I think my mum and dad, they had an outside toilet in those days. <laughs> so uh, they had to move. And, uh, and obviously I was born there, so the house was too small, so we had to move. And uh, we moved to Limwood. And, and Limwood a, was a really buoyant area because of the Chrysler car plant. Mm-hmm. That was that was massive for, for Limwood, and when that went when that went downhill, it, it really hurt hurt Limwood as a whole. But I was really fortunate that at that time there was uh, street football, like probably you don't see now. So my street, yeah. my street would play other streets in the vicinity, and it was it could become twelve aside, fifteen aside, eight aside. It could become like that. And I, I played with guys that were a lot older than me at, at that time, so. Um, that's when I kind of still started to kind of really get into football where my dad and that, my mum were quite sportive and they, they helped me along the way. Without my mum and dad, when they have the career I had, probably that's because mm-hmm. they were really sporty as well. So, And then I get street football and then boys club level came on the scene when I was seven. And then um, limited a five-a-side tournament and the, the guy that ran it actually became my boys club manager. And he was brilliant, and um, he was actually a policeman as well. Believe it or not, he was a policeman. But he, <laughs> again, there's a lot of people I could thank for my own career, and he was certainly one of them because he he kept me on the straight and narrow. He ran the school team and he ran the boys club team, and he set up the the limited police five sides, which was a it used to be. It was an incredible tournament how he set up that, and. Um, and then that's how it kind of really started to go, you know. It really started to go from there. So I really started when I was, I was probably seven, uh, on that side of it. And as you mentioned, coming up through the boys' club, you were eventually then picked up by St Mirren at quite a young age. What? How did that come about? Were they scouting you from for a couple of months, or was it just a case of something came along one day? Uh, I, we were playing. We were playing for the boys' club at that time, and they, 
we were playing bad head boys club and they were a good side at that time. It was always us and them that were like rivals as such. And they had a good side and um, we played them in the Scottish Cup or the, or the Scottish Cup at that age level it was. And our manager at the time, there was two pictures in, um, in Limited at that time. It was in a school called Moss Edge, which, small, which was my old primary school. Mm-hmm. It was a big pitch and a small pitch. And a new manager actually chose to play them on the small pitch because it gave us a bigger advantage. And that's how clever he was. And uh, we beat, I think we beat them 2-0. And we never knew, but there was always a crowd at these sort of games. Mm-hmm. Never knew who was watching or anything like that. And then I think it was a Maybe a couple of weeks later, we got a call to say we could be going to some on trial and, uh, on a Thursday night. And um, Ricky McFallum was the manager at that time. And uh, Eric Sorison uh, was, was the coach. And um, we went into St Murray on, on a Thursday night. And the first night we went there, there was no other young players there. And uh, we got our nights mixed up. And believe it or not, <laughs> believe it or not Stevie Clark and Dougie Sumner were in, they were in part time Stevie mm-hmm. and, uh, and Doogie and uh, you, I don't know if you remember but Love Street used to have a big running track around it yes yep. and had a big area behind the, the, the visiting end mm-hmm. and Stevie and Doogie took myself and a guy called Noddy and uh, to play two a side against them out in the back <laughs> in Love Street and uh, we couldn't get a kick of the ball that, that was it and we were only 12 at that time 12 or 13 and it wasn't, we got word to go back in the following Thursday. And all of a sudden, there was loads of kids from, maybe from Renfrew, from Greenock, from Linwood, from Barhead, from every, everywhere in the, in the area, from Porso, from Easter Craigs. So Mern had a load, of, a load of kids in there. And um, so Mern were playing, uh, they were playing f- final at the time. And they, I went to the game and Johan Cruyff was playing mm-hmm. that night and then the first leg and someone went on the second leg and it wasn't long after that Ricky McFarlane resigned from St Mum <clears throat> and um, so we, we didn't know what we were doing we were just told to keep coming in on a Thursday night to train mm-hmm. and you could have went in the following Thursday and there would have been other different kids there if, if they didn't like you they would say thanks very much see you later mm-hmm. and there were other guys coming in so St Martin pointed Alec Muller, Martin Ferguson and Drew Jarvie um, to do it. And I think that was the biggest turning point in my career. Of, and I always say, thank God they three were there when, 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 when we were growing up because they, they never let us move. They kept an eye on us. They kept, they kept us on a straight and narrow. They kept us mm-hmm. in good habits. They got us a game understanding which is really, really important. It's not about skills, tricks and everything. You, you need to know the game and positional things where you need to go. And, and Alec Muller, Martin Ferris and George Harvey owe a hell of a lot to because they they gave me the good habits. And you see that a lot nowadays. There's a lot of kids that join the pro youth teams at the likes of 8, 9, 10, 11. And it's always the fans' dream to see people coming right through the system, right in and breaking into the first team, which is exactly what you did under the manager of Alex Smith. Now, a lot has been said about how he has been a sort of father figure for Scottish football for a, a lot of talent that he's brought through. Do you think he actually gets enough credit for the players he brought through? Because it was almost a, a complete generation under him. No, no, it was, but it was Alec Muller, really, for me, that, that and Martin Ferguson and Drew Jardy. They were the three that... Alec Muller gave me my debut when I was 15, 16. Mm-hmm. Again, my first professional league game was against Motherwell, and he put me on, and they were going to beat 1-0 when I went on. And for some reason, I, I kind of turned the game, and it's Mum's favour, and won 2-1. And he put me on the bench at Dumbarton, at Old Dumbarton, when I was 15 in a friendly, when I was 15. Then he gave me my debut when I was 16. And he, he kept me in, in the realms of that. And he, he gave me my debut with, um, against Aberdeen. We, we played the love sheet and we drew one each and I scored. Mm-hmm. And right back was Stevie Clark at the time. Stevie was playing right, right back. And I was, and I, 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 I was, I was Stevie's kind of boot boy at that time as well. <laughs> and, uh, and Stevie played behind me. And um, I think Frank McGarvey played as well. Tony Fitzpatrick played. Really good players. Mm-hmm. That I played and um, 
and then Alec went to um, he went to Hibs and Martin and um, they, they all went, which was a which was a blow for me because I I, I didn't know what to expect next. I thought, well, these guys are away, and then Alex Smith came in and he took it on again. He took it again and looked after us the same way Alec Muller did, and and was great with us. He, he was. For every bit as good as Alec Muller was, Alex Smith was up there with him because he kept he kept us on the discipline role and the, and the the jobs that we had to do and the ground staff where we had to do everything on the ground staff, which was which was so important to learn. And plus, I played reserve football against men, and I never played what you see now academy football where you play against your own age. I was if I was playing the reserves, I'd play at fifteen and I'd play against a guy who's twenty seven or 28 and all, all those sort of things so I, I played against a guy called Ralph Callaghan at Hibs and he was a season pro and gave me an absolute roasting <laughs> didn't know what I was doing I was 15 I was at Easter Road but what a learning club it was because it, it brought me into good habits and it made mm-hmm. me drop really really quickly and that's why I think at that time playing against men from going a lot quicker than what it probably does nowadays Do you think that's part of the the problem in Scottish yeah. football at the minute is the lack of this reserve football. It's all about development sides and maybe one over 23 playing. But back in those days, it was if you were coming back into the squad, if you weren't playing on the Saturday, you were playing in the reserves. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah 100%. And I know people have got their own opinion of it, but that's my opinion of it. Without that development and playing against grown men at that time, I, I wouldn't have had a career. Because I needed, you needed to be thrown around. And you need to mm-hmm. realise that you're in a professional sport you had to win. Whereas maybe now the academy football is all development and they take away the winning aspect where whereas you had to win because professional sports are the winning. And if you can get a title or a trophy at the end of it, then brilliant. If you don't, then it's no probably where you want to take your career to go. You need to win things. And I think mm-hmm. that's important that people went away from that. Whereas growing up, I was getting kicked around and thrown around with older men and then you know how to handle yourself as you get older whereas um, uh, yeah now maybe it's just a little bit different from, from when I was growing up and that's obviously put you in good stead because still whilst you were young you were part of what is one of St Mirren's greatest achievements in winning the Scottish Cup back in 87 what did that do to the club as a whole did it kind of install this belief that you could go on and achieve even more I think it was a brilliant thing, but I think I think it became a burden to them and it held them mm-hmm. back. I think the where I think it became fantastic for was for the town, uh, a Paisley itself, for for the prestige of the club and for the history of the club. It, it became an incredible thing. But I also think people in the hierarchy get too ahead of themselves and think, oh, we've arrived and this is what's going to happen and we're going to do this and that. And all of a sudden, it went in a downhill spiral. It never, it never materialised to what it... I'm not going to say St Martin was ever going to be a, a massive club, but it should have been a club where it was it was just under that, that yeah. level of maybe Hearts and Hibs, because the town was the big... I think it's the biggest town in Scotland, I think, Paisley. So yeah. it, it, became, it became an unbelievable thing to do, but I also think it held the football club back, because I think people in the hierarchy definitely thought well, that's how they arrived, and we took it out. I think the club took the eye off the ball, and um, not long after that, and, and too many managerial changes. Alex Smith goes, and it, it, it was it just never stabilised from it. And you stayed at the club for eight seasons, I believe, as well. Was there ever a point during that time where an opportunity arose for you to leave the club to maybe go to somewhere bigger or somewhere else? Well, I went to speak to. Um, Jim McLean at Dundee United. So I played in the I played in the Scottish centenary team against um, Scott, the, the Scotland team at Hamden, mm-hmm. um, and we won one 0 We made a really good side at that that time. And um, Jim McLean picked me at that time. He was a manager, and um, he he came in uh, for me to go. So I went up to speak to him at Canada's, and the season was starting on the Saturday. <laughs> And he asked me to go up and see him on the on the Thursday. So I went up and seen him, and uh, and he told me how it was. This is it. This is it. This is it. But he only gave me a day to decide. He said, "I've got one. You've got one day to decide whether you want to come or not." So I travelled back to to my parents, and uh, 
my dad said, what are you going to do? I said, dad, I don't know. And he said, go with your gut feeling. And I got up in the morning and I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sign. So I was into something around and I had a foot on and all that. I tell you, I think Jimmy Bourne was manager at the time. I don't mm-hmm. really tell Jimmy that I was going to leave. And, and um, I go to Love Street and Jimmy says, what, what's your answer? What are you going to do? And I went, I don't know. So I went from my house to Love Street thinking I'm going to go. As soon as I hit Love Street, I think... Almost I'm, changed your mind right away. I and Jimmy, Jimmy actually said, he said, as I said, Love Street had the big kind of running track, gravel bit around the pitch. And he said, why don't you go and just do a, a walk around the, around, the, around the pitch? Come back in and tell me your answer. So I done that, walked around the pitch and I came back into the TC Jimmy. He said, what are you going to do? So I'm not going... And that, and that was my decision to, to uh, not to go so I stayed with Motherwell maybe I don't know maybe a few more weeks after that and then Tommy McLean came in and I decided I was going uh, I went to Motherwell and as you said you, you made the move to Motherwell after eight fantastic years at St Mirren mm-hmm. winning the Scottish Cup you kind of one of your first experiences uh, getting there is the time you're playing against what would then become one of your next moves is Borussia Dortmund in the UEFA Cup. Mm. Now, you've moved from St. St. Mirren to Motherwell. You're playing in the UEFA Cup. Did you think that one day you could actually get to that level? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because um, we, 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 the first leg was in Dortmund. And um, uh, I, I, the time when Sky first came on the scene, I, I used to watch German football and it was a Friday night and there was a programme called Sat Eins. And Sat Eins was always Bundesliga Friday night games. Mm-hmm. So I always used to watch it and I always used to see the atmospheres and think, dear, oh dear, look at the atmospheres there. <laughs> and uh, my son was due to get born and um, mother will get drawn with Bruce Dortmund away. And uh, I said to Alec McLeish, I said, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not coming uh, if my son's not born I wouldn't be there and see my son being born so he went okay no problem because obviously Tom McLean was a man before he was brilliant and Muller at that time had a really really good side really good side under Tom McLean mm-hmm. and, and God bless him a lot of guys have died uh, that team that I played in and um, uh, guys that had so much uh, joy we were playing with uh, they had Jamie Dolan Phil O'Donnell David Cooper incredible players and um, Paul McGrillan really sad but they, we had a really good side at that time and, and we got drawn against Motherwell and uh, against Dortmund at that. and I said to Ali I said I'm not going to come I said if my son's not born and uh, he was born just before the maybe two days before the team flew out to Dortmund and then we um, we played the game and I had one of the games where I had a really good game I remember doing the warm down with Billy Davis. Mm-hmm. Two years like that. My God, imagine playing in front of this crowd every week. That's true. And three years later, I ended up playing there. There was a player that you mentioned and you sadly spoke about the fact that some of that team that you played with are, are no longer with us. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to kind of touch on Paul McGrillan. Now, he was sent off in the, the second leg of that game. Um, and then he lost his battle, sadly, with the mental health aspect. When you look at football nowadays and you look at the abuse that players are getting, can you see why it, like, football really does need to act in this terms of mental health and help players out? I think it's a terrible thing. I think the the guys that I played with, Paul, Phil, Jamie, David Cooper, um, really sad. Really sad what happened there. Um, um, guys were a bit more in age. Obviously, Cooper was a bit, a bit older. But it's really, really sad. And mental health is a, is a massive, massive thing in, in the world, let alone football. And then um, one thing about being a footballer, you have to be really mentally strong. I don't do really social media at all. I don't go near it. I don't touch it. I don't, I, I'm not interested in that, to be, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I know that's the way the world and, and, and but when you see what's happening in the world with what that's abuse to people you, you're you're getting into arguments with people you don't even know and who hide behind these things and uh, I really think it's not a nice place to, to go into with that as a footballer 
I was always brought up to play the game, never really getting embroiled with any praise or negativity. I always stayed in a flat level with it. And um, that's where I've loved my life, really. So I, I came from a generation where it was never prominent. I know it's the way of the world now, but the, the, the football people, players, especially ones who maybe don't make a lot of money out of the game and finish football at 35 and they don't have a career or the finances to support themselves or their families, or yeah, that is tough. That is really mm-hmm. tough. And if there can be more to be done, yeah, then it's, it's a great thing to for people to look at, but it's no, it's no social media and that for, for me is not a great, yeah, it's not a great um, communication level, you know. And obviously, just touching on Paul again, he sadly did pass away. What was your memories of playing alongside him? He was one that I think was kind of underrated amongst that team, wasn't he? I, that era, or that time, Mother was, I said, the four lads, Coop was just leaving. Um, Mother and I came in and played a few games with him. Phil Donald had a great time with um great player, played him in Celtic, great player. Unbelievable fitness, Phil Donald, incredible mm-hmm. fitness. Jamie Dolan was was a brilliant guy, just a really honest pro, good guy, no any problems. It was a great player to play, a very underrated player. And Paul McGrillan was probably one of the life and so the dressing room. The way he was, it, it was so chirpy and bouncing in and banter and, and, and all good things like that. And a really good footballer, really, really good finisher. Paul McGrillan and um, but what you see sometimes addressing him you don't know what's happening behind closed doors and and but Paul you never ever thought for one minute that would have happened there it was just so so sad so so sad but life and soul addressing him that's for sure and as in, if anyone is watching right now and they are going through their own personal struggles, then do reach out. There is people that will be there that want to help you. Um, it is, it's a problem across the whole of the UK that needs to be resolved. And if uh, if anyone does need their help, then please do reach out to the, the right authorities and you'll get what you need. I think that's important. Um, I think that's the important thing you're saying there. I think the, the important thing is, is speak. Speak to people that can help you. Don't hide behind it. Just, just speak to people. I think that's that's the best bit of advice. Is, is don't ball up yourself. You know, it's um, yeah. I think that's really, really important going forward. Yeah, I think this this whole pandemic's made the mental health crisis across the world a lot worse. Um, and those that were struggling before have, have made it even harder on themselves at times. And I think, that, as you said, the most important thing is to reach out, to speak out, mm-hmm. and people will listen to you. Um, so if you are in that situation please do get the help that you need Um, so moving on obviously three years at Motherwell um, three fantastic seasons JFA Cup finishing third as well and then you you kind of leave and you've got trials of PSV and Dortmund how did those come around? Um, well so I was coming out of contact at Motherwell and and Brad McKinnon who who was another really great throwback at Motherwell at that time signed for 20 yesterday in the summer and that was when the um, the Bosman rolling was kicking in Mm-hmm. And um, Rab phoned me one day. He said, "An agent wants your number. Uh, will you speak to him?" I said, "Yeah, yeah." So a, a guy called Ton Van Dalen phoned me, and um, I, I never knew Ton at all. I never met him. And he says, "Paul, do you want to go and try abroad?" I mean, "Yeah, that'd be great." He said, "Well, give me ten days, and I'll tell you. The, I'll, I'll see if I can get something for you." And sure enough, ten days he phoned me. He says, "Paul." Um, What's your plan? He said, well, Mother, we're going to Northampton in pre-season tomorrow. He says, um, pack your bags and come over to Holland. So anyway, I've done it. Never told Mother where I was going. Packed a bag, jumped in a flight to, to Amsterdam and a, a flight to Enschede. And I, I never knew to him. And I went over there and this guy standing with a placard, Paul Lambert. So he's talking for the first time. He said, "Nice to meet you." He said, "I'll tell you where you're going. You're going to PS Feintover, and if that doesn't work, then you're going to Bishop Dortmund." And I went, "Well, you know, dear, I never, expect, never expected this." So I went to Eindhoven and I stayed five days. And and Dick, Dick Advocate was a coach. Mm-hmm. But Eindhoven did a really good side of that thing. So I played two games and um, scored two goals. But I played in the right wing, and I was never a winger. Never, I never the speed for that. 
and uh, Dick came up to my room and he said, Paul, I know you're going to Bush Dortmund, good luck, hope it works. And uh, Tony and I jumped in the car, drove to Dortmund. Tony and, and Michael Meyer had, had done a deal. Mm-hmm. If the trials went well, the deal was already there. If it didn't go well, I went back, back to Scotland and God knows what I'd have done. And then um, uh, went and met the Dortmund guys in a mini tournament. Um, and I realised then I was in big time football because I've never seen a support like that in a friendly. So, yeah, that's how it kind of came about. Played four trial games and then they asked me to sign and then that was me. And it was it was, it was probably the, the career-defining moment, really, which turned my whole career upside down. You, you just mentioned that you don't know what you would have done if the Dortmund trial mm. didn't go well. Yeah. Was there any other options on the table in Scotland or in England, or was that a case of this PSV Dor- uh, Dortmund or back to Motherwell? Yeah, and, and, and Motherwell wouldn't have been a shoo because Motherwell didn't even know where I was. Mm-hmm. I, I never told them at that time. I was taking the, the Bosman rule, and, and, and um, it's a strange thing because John Mark Bosman. I actually spoke to him just about a month or two ago, and and uh, and because I, I saw the documentary on him on, on uh, BT Sport, mm-hmm. and, I, and I tracked his number down. I got a hold of his number and I actually uh, done a Zoom call with him because I was one of the first ones to take it on. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, it was a brilliant conversation I had with him uh, at, at that time. So I never realised the extent of what he'd done. And, and I don't think anybody does realise until you watch the documentary. Then you think what the guy put himself through, and, and, and basically, I just wanted to thank him really for doing it because it mm-hmm. turned my career, my fortune upside down, really. So it's a big thing for 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 him to have took took the world of football on, and um, so it was a nice nice conversation. So, but nobody ever knew where I was. Mother never knew. Probably the first time Mother knew is when I signed. Basically, that's when we knew. Mm-hmm. And there was no other options on the table in Scotland or in, in England no, at that point, no? No, nothing, nothing. No, absolutely nothing, no. So it was, it was, it was like taking a 10 pence over there and throwing it in the air and catching and saying, take your gamble and hopefully it works, you know? So you're moving and making that move even now from Motherwell to Borussia Dortmund would be incredible, yeah. but back then it was just as big. What was your expectations when you signed the deal? Were you thinking, it's going to take me a wee while to get used to the football over here, I'll try and get the odd minutes here and there, or were you expecting just to kind of continue your development? When I went over there and I seen the players, no. Did I think I was ever going to walk into the team or did I ever think I was going to start? Did I ever think I was going to make the bench? Never. Because they had guys that won World Cups, guys that won Serie A, guys that won Bundesliga titles. The Brazilian internationals there, the European footballer there, the, the half the German national team were there, and I thought, well, well, one thing I'm going to do is going to go learn. I'm going to go and learn what what it is like over here. And that was my mindset. And we trained on a Thursday, and um, Pablo Sosa, Pablo had just signed from from Juve mm-hmm. for seven million Deutsch, uh, seven million Deutschmarks at that time. And then Paolo just won the Champions League the season before. So Paolo came in and and, um, and Otmar came out and said that if Paolo's knees not, doesn't hold up for Saturday's game against Bayer Leverkusen, then you play. So I thought, uh, OK. And the first half was an absolute disaster. I was up against a guy called Paolo Sergio, who he, he ran me ragged. And, but just by pure luck, I scored just before half time, so that gave me a little bit of confidence. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I remember getting to half time. I said to Andy, well, Andy, what's right? What's left? What's man on? What's time? So I never knew the German language in football terms. And it was like a little when the game was was just bypassing me really by. And I went, anyway, we lost the game 4 2. And uh, we played for two and a on Tuesday night. And Otmar came up, and come up to me on the Monday and says, Paul, he said, he said, I was happy with you, but if Paul was fit, I'm going to put you on the bench against Dusseldorf. I said, OK, no problem. It's, it's, no, it's no an issue. Mm-hmm. We're training Tuesday morning, Paul's knee doesn't hold up. He puts me back in, and I've won a day games where I could have closed my eyes and the ball was going where I wanted to go. <laughs> I set up two goals, and everything worked. It went pitch perfect. And from that from that moment, it just went both like that. And then I never, I never missed a game, really. It's almost as if you were playing FIFA on the PlayStation. It was just everything was going perfectly. I, I was, I was just clicked. 
the 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 team, the support, we may, the, the the individual players, the, the dressing room, the camaraderie we had, the, the coach we had, the the fan base we had, everything was just. And as the season went on, I realised I was playing for a special team, mm-hmm. really, really special team as the season went on. You mentioned just before that that you kind of went over there to add to your learning experience and it's something that we've seen in more recent times with a lot of young Scottish players heading over there. Bayern Munich have certainly picked a couple up and even the English players, guys like Jaden Sancho, Jude Bellingham, all making that move across to Germany. What is it about the German football that attracts these young talents to go over there to aid their development? Well, I think if you... If Bellingham and Sancho, for example, who go to, who go to more club, Dortmund Day. Sancho's played in front of the crowd, so he will know how special a club it is. Bellingham is not, but playing terrifically well. I think he'll see the full, the, the full size of the club once the crowd starts to come back in, but he's playing absolutely fantastic at the minute. I think the development of them is, is great. They, when I went there all the years ago, I had to learn the language through the dressing room, whereas now they have teachers and classrooms and things like that it's a different a different thing so they probably get a little bit more luxury that way whereas I went in I had to learn everything as I went through it the language the everything with it so that that was that was a learning curve on its own just trying to get the language right but now English is so universal mm-hmm. everybody speaks it so I'm pretty sure that the dressing at Dortmund at minute a lot of English speaking lads there mm-hmm. I went in there you had guys that spoke English, but you also had guys that, that didn't really speak English. So, and you had to learn what was going on and about you. So, the language for me was one of the most important aspects you had to get. On the kind of aspect of Sancho and Bellingham, and even um, ex Celtic youth players like Liam Morrison going to Bayern Munich, do these players look at it as there's a better chance of making the first team by going to Germany than staying at the clubs here in the UK? No, if you're going to buy a mate and drop, I don't know. If I, <laughs> uh, uh, do you ask a question? I get asked a lot. Do, do I think the, the young players? I think it's great if you get the right club, you get the right mm-hmm. coach, you get the right players. If you go to a club where maybe you think, well, I'm not going to get a game, or am I going to be in the squad, or I'm not going to be in the squad, that become difficult because you want to play. You want to play. I went over in an era where. I said to you, four guys won titles left, right, and centre, World Cups, winners, European Champions League winners, Euro 96 winners, Serie A title winners, that guys that were riddled with success. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I had to find that bracket of can I do it with them? And I have to really, really be strong with it. And then it, it may just went from there where. It, the team in Dortmund at the minute is full of young players and they're trying to strive to these overhaul Bayern. But you look at Bayern, it's a strong, strong team. But if you're coming from Scotland or England and trying to force your way into these sort of teams at the minute is, is, is really tough. Unless you are probably an exceptional talent like Bellingham and Sancho. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned in your intro, you're a Champions League winner and that came during your time at Borussia mm-hmm. Dortmund. Coming up to that final, you were kind of tasked with marking who was probably the best player in the world at that time in Zinedine Zidane. I don't think it was expected that Dortmund would go on and win that game, but and I'm not just saying this because you're here, but a lot of people have said that you put in a fantastic man of the match performance in that game. Um, t- talk us through the kind of build up to it and the game itself. Is it best? Is it one of your greatest memories from playing football? Yeah, of course. Uh, coming from Glasgow and a small part in, in, in Scotland and being in a in a in the company of great great players to win the, the European Cup, stroke Champions League, it is an incredible honour. And to play against Juve in the final, arguably against one of the greatest teams in the last twenty thirty years, Juve at that time, Zidane, Delivio. Deshaun, Del Piero, Christian Vieri, Alan Bosses, unbelievable team, UV. And um, we obviously playing in Munich was a great thing for us. I played in Munich, but it wasn't as hard as what people actually portray it. 
The Sniffle question because Zidane is, is a, was an unbelievable player. He was so early with both feet and he's a tall man as well. And um, I've met him since the final, you know, and we, we had a chat and, uh, uh, when I saw him at Real Madrid. So, um, uh, incredible player. But I was used to that role because I played against Nemi Scholl, Stefan Effenberg, Jorge Haji, uh, Hasler, all great number 10s in their own right. I played Rivaldo. All these. I, I knew the role that, that, mm-hmm. that it consisted. Uh, where you had to do it against the Dan was probably unbelievable discipline where, where he was in the pitch. So the ball, for example, was away on the left side and he drifted to the right. You had to forget the ball and look where he was because you know if he got it in a space where he could hurt you, you were in trouble. Mm-hmm. So it, it, I was used to that. That's not to say it wasn't a tough game and keep my eye on him, but I was used to that role of doing that. And it, as I said, everything just went went my way that night. And obviously you became the first British player in a non-British side to win the Champions League. That's something that everyone will be talking about in pub quizzes for years to come. Probably quite a few people's had that question in a pub quiz over lockdown, but <laughs> it's a kind of special way to look back on your career with that. What, do, what have you done with the winner's medal? Have you still got it? Uh, I've still got it, yeah. I've still, uh, I've still um, yeah, it's in a cabinet. I never, had, I never ever had anything on show um, until maybe a year ago. I used to just keep everything away, really. But um, now as I got probably a bit older, I thought, OK, bring bring the things out that, I'd, that I've achieved. And, yeah, it surprises me how much I've achieved because I never realised what I'd actually done until I actually pulled everything out, really. I don't know, I think if it was me and I'd won the Champions League, I'd have it on the mantelpiece with all the arrows pointing to it, just, just uh, for anybody that walked in the house just to say, yeah, I'd won that, do you know? Uh, no, it, 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 you know, it's, I never really talk about it until people like you guys ask me about it, because I think it's on your memory, you know, I, I don't need to portray what I've won or I don't need to say because people obviously know, so people don't want to hear my... Well, maybe they do. Don't want to hear my, <laughs> my my lifestyle, I guess. No, I think they definitely want to hear about the time you won the Champions League and there's more trophies that we're going to talk about as well and that comes from your transfer to Celtic so you moved to Celtic in the November after winning the Champions League how did that come about? How did you go from winning the Champions League to returning back to Scottish football? Well, there were so many factors my son wasn't keeping well and then um, there was loads of teams come in for me after the Champions League final, loads, loads in Europe, and then um, I turned everybody down because I, I was so happy in Dortmund. It was an unbelievable club. I was, I was actually loved by the supporters, and, and I love playing with the club. I love the club still because it's the way the way it is. I've been back on numerous occasions. A special club, Richard Dortmund, and, and if you, it's very difficult when you're there. It's a, it really attracts you. To it, and um, the, the clubs I, I turned down were massive clubs to turn down. I didn't want to move at all, whether it be Celtic, whether it be UV or whatever, Bayern or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then um, never wanted to do it. And then um, my son took no well, and we spoke to the doctors, and, and he was only two at the time. And this could last, this thing he had could last until he was five or six. And I thought, this is going to be too difficult here. And, we decided, Celtic asked me to come back before, and I said no. Um, before, Bim Janssen actually called me in the Aberdeen boot room in Scotland. We're playing in um, Belarus because Hampton was getting revamped. Yep. And uh, Vim said, Can you just give me one more chance to see it? I know you didn't want to come. And then, then this kind of started to go from there, and I made the choice to come back. But it was. It was really difficult to come back because Dortmund gave me everything. And the emotion in my last game at Dortmund was, I never expected that with the fans and what actually they'd done. With, the, with no leaving the stadium and banners everywhere. And it was, it was just a horrible thing to leave. And for two months at Celtic, I couldn't, I couldn't kick my own backside. It was terrible because the emotion in my head was still in Dortmund and everything was going on. And all of a sudden, it started to pick up. And we came back, well, I came back in a season where the pressure was probably yeah, massive, massive pressure. Yeah, you, you speak about that massive pressure. It was the, the pressure of stopping Rangers from winning their 10th consecutive league title in a row. And 
the kind of players that you played alongside there as well. You mentioned someone before, Phil O'Donnell, who was a fantastic player. Did that kind of... How was that jump for you going from playing in the Bundesliga? You said for two months you couldn't kick it back your own backside. Is that just the, the difference in football? Or was it the mind still being in Germany? Or was it actually the pressure of that season coming onto it as well? Bit of a combination of the three? No, the football was easy. Easy. That, that was easy. That was, that was um, the emotion of uh, what the fans done for me at Dortmund was, was incredible. I mean, that. I never expected that last game against Parma where, uh, I don't know, 60,000 people, 70,000 people don't leave the stadium and sing your name and have banners everywhere and people were crying at my car, don't go and things like that. It was just a horrendous thing. And um, then going from Bush or Dortmund to Trinity Celtic was easy. It was easy. But on that, on a football and sense, that was the pressure of it. Absolutely love because Dortmund gave me that high pressure octane of we have to win, we have to win mm-hmm. trophies or the Bundesliga or the Champions League, we have to we have to win. So granted, Celtic was easy to play football. Uh, the guys that I played with, a lot of my youth, the Scottish team, the national team, so that that was easy. The pressure I tried to stop a really good Rangers side at that time was what it was. That was never going to change. That that was the pressure. We just had to stay in our coattails probably and. and Try and overturn that ten in a row. So, uh, going in there, what I'd done with Bruce Dortmund, it didn't matter who I played against. I knew I could, I knew I could handle them on. And obviously, as we mentioned, that is the season that Celtic stopped what um, Rangers won in ten consecutive league titles in a row. And there'll be a lot of highlights from that season. But most Celtic fans would probably say, if it isn't the last day of the season, it was the goal in the, the Derby game at New Year the 25 yard strike every Celtic fan you talk to says it's 25 yards it's 30 yards it's 35 yards yeah. what was going through your head during that point is it just a case I hit it and let's hope it goes in or did you know so the second you left your boot that's it I've scored uh, I, knew, I knew as soon as I struck it I was in and then because uh, um, Craig scored Craig Burley scored the first goal and Jackie we Jackie done brilliant for him and uh, he reverses it and Craig scores a great goal and Craig was on Incredible goal scoring form that that year, and um, uh, we knew we had to win. We had to win that game to pull them back. Rangers were a good side at that time. Golf, Gorham, McCoy, Gaza, Loud. They were, they were all there. They were a proper side. Ian Ferguson, they were played with Ferguson, man. And uh, when when I think maybe I don't think it was Fergie missed kicked it actually, and it just dropped him. It was on the, it was on the half volley, and I thought I'm going to hit this. And it just, as soon as I left my foot, I thought, Andy's not getting it because the ball <laughs> I had the bend on it, you know, it, it never went straight. It just it had the bend on it when he ran. I thought, it's going in. And, he, and then, and as you say, that, that's probably the goal that people still talk about, really, to this, this kind of day when they speak to me, really. And then obviously the last day drama of stopping Rangers winning the 10 in a row. Henry mm-hmm. kind of sets the tone really early on with the goal and then Harold kind of wraps it up. Was mm-hmm. there a, a sense of relief or was it more just the, the passion and the celebration of winning the title when the kind of final whistle goes? I think everything. The relief, the, the, the achievement of stopping that. Because Vim Janssen... Probably doesn't get the credit he deserved on it because one season at it and to build a team as quick as what he'd done. Mm-hmm. So that really, really good on your side. Um, we deserve to win it. The, the title, we, we deserve to win it. So Henry scores a great goal. And then after that, it became a bit nervous because there's no noise coming from Tanadai. So you knew probably Rangers were winning at that point. Mm-hmm. And then Harold scores a, the goal that makes it at 2 0. And then so, so it was a mixture of probably relief. The, the, the job has been done at the 10 in a row at that time you thought probably never would happen again until this season <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah so the pressure of it was huge because you had 60,000 in there demanding that you had to win but that was the beauty of it playing for Celtic the, the pressure on you was was, uh, was massive and for how long did the celebrations go on into the night was it a, a late oh, one? <laughs> oh yeah that was um, do you know the big thing for that? that I always remember that, and it's a, it's, a, it's a silly thing. I remember that they were um, the celebration was going great, and it, it was all starting to die down. And I remember sitting in the dressing room there, and the Paul McStay came in, 
And the uh, and well, Paul's had this way to have a cover. What were you? None of them knew Paul mm-hmm. uh, that time. And uh, he, he came and shook my eyes. I just want to say, absolutely brilliant. And I thought Paul might stay because might stay for me was one of the great Celtic players, the captains in his day. Paul and uh, that meant a lot uh, for Paul to stay. He came in that that uh, right after the game and came in and saw me. And because uh, I probably played the same role as him, so. Mm-hmm. I, a little bit here and there either way um, but it, it meant a lot because I thought Paul McStay was one of, the, one of the greatest players that Scotland's produced I guess it was almost like a kind of passage of rights of Paul's era handing over to yourself to guide Celtic on for yeah. that sort of next period and we'll get into that and we'll talk about the kind of years under Martin O'Neill um, in a wee bit but during that period of time in Scottish football it was almost common for Scotland to qualify for major tournaments. Now, this summer coming up will be 23 years since Scotland last played in a major tournament. And I have to say, I actually don't remember a lot of World Cup 98. So that's I'm really looking forward to this summer because yeah. this will be the first one I really remember. But that qualification campaign, it was almost a case of Scotland were just really expecting to get through. You were drawn against Austria, Sweden, Estonia, and um, Belarus. And the, there's the game that every... Scotland fan will remember and it was the one team in Tallinn tell us a bit more about that what was that experience like? It was weird uh, obviously you're saying that the Scotland team expected to qualify they expected to qualify because they had really good players mm-hmm. that era Gary McAllister John Collins Colin Calderwood Tommy Boyd Gorham McCoy they had a really good side at that, at that time so yeah. Was it was it a thing of these everybody expected? They expected Scotland to be running about it anyway. I think that that was the thing. And the Stoney game was we got wind it that they might not turn up that that morning. Not the way, way the game. It, it, there was a death of fans. There was, there was nobody there really there. We thought we wonder wonder what's going. We takes back the team. And anyway, we had to get ready as normal. Just mm-hmm. like normal. The referee done the same things. The referee checked your boots and everything like that, and we had to walk out and line up. And uh, I think John, John, and somebody else, maybe Darren Jackson, maybe took centre. And the referee blew the whistle, and that was it. Finished. And uh, it, but you had to do it right as if you were preparing for the game. But mm-hmm. he made it. He made us get ready. He made us. He checked the boots. He, we walked out the tunnel. We went into the pits, took centre, and then. They never, they were now. And then they moved the game to play again in, in Monaco. I think they moved it in Monaco. Mm-hmm. The, the replay was doing 0 at that time. But um, whereas maybe FIFA should have um, or UEFA should have said no, Scotland get three points. Or maybe yeah, that, mm-hmm. that was the big kind of talking point, wasn't it? it was the the kind of president of the UEFA at the time, um, the Swedish man? I think it was Johan Andersson his name was, was determined for Scotland and Estonia to replay that game. And a yeah. lot of criticism was put up there because they believed he was doing it to best Sweden's interest to help them qualify as well. Looking back on it now, do you think Scotland should have got the three points for that or was there something kind of underhand at play? 100% we should have got the three points. That, that, if that happened now, you'd have got three points if a team doesn't turn up. So I think there was a dispute. Uh, on them with a, with a bonus system or whatever it was, Estonia. So it's their prerogative not to turn up if they don't want to play. But uh, UEFA should have turned and said Scotland get three points. We shouldn't have been made to go to Monaco and play play uh, play them. Whether, whether it was a draw or whether we won or not, we shouldn't have been made to go to Monaco. And, and plus get Scotland fans to go to Estonia, then Scotland fans to go to to Monaco, so that it wasn't it wasn't right. It should have been Scotland should have got three points for. And thankfully, it didn't really come to much. The, although it was not the three points, it was only the one point. Scotland did qualify, although the last day of the campaign was certainly an interesting one. Basically, looking at the table, Scotland had to equal or better Sweden's result to get through. Scotland were at home that day to Latvia at Celtic Park. Another last day triumph at Celtic Park. You must have been starting to get used to those. <laughs> that was sure was brilliant that day. That day, I mean, I think the, the big game was beating Austria at home at Parkhead as well. I think that was a huge game because mm-hmm. it was 
being Sweden that I wrote, so they're, so they're good game for it. But um, Belarus away, and Gary, Gary McAllister scores a penalty, and, a, and the, the field was terrible in Belarus, and Gary scores a penalty to beat them 1 0. But the, the, that game, you're talking about a Latvia game. I, th- I think, did Gordon Jury score that day? Did Gordon? He did, yep. Gordon yeah, scored that header, yeah. I, and the noise at Parkhead that day was unbelievable because the work had been done and going right to the last day, he says, or the last game, was an incredible thing. It was, an, it was a great achievement, but you, you would never have thought 23 years later that that would be the last tournament they ever qualified for. And tw- I mean, 23 years ago, we're talking France 98, a mm. fantastic tournament, albeit, and you opened up against the defending champions in Brazil. Now, you've mentioned playing for Dortmund, you're lined up against these Champions League winners, these World Cup winners, and there was a bit of that experience in the Scotland squad. They definitely played against that level before. I don't yeah. think you'll have that this summer when the team lines up, because there's maybe only some of the Celtic players and Kieran Tierney and Andy Robertson that have played at that level. But you guys yeah. had the experience, so was there no fear going into that game? Did you really think you could beat them? Uh, I think for us it was, it was a free hat. Really, it was mm-hmm. a free hit. I mean, oh, if you're not going to win the World Cup, well, the next best thing is to open it against the, 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 arguably one of the greatest nations to ever play the game. So, and the team that they had, it was all that day, dear oh dear, I mean, it was, it, 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 they were absolutely star studied, you know, and um, playing in the Stade de France in your stadium was a great, a great thing for us, but the, we were so unlucky. Really unlucky not to get get a result from it. But it's a point, and don't go by Tommy. If the ball has Tommy Boyd in the chest, it falls into Jimmy Jimmy Ian's arms. Mm-hmm. Because it has on this in the the joint, in the shoulder, and the arm, it ricochets and it gives him the bounce. But we, I think we should have had a penalty, another penalty with a, with a free kick. Mm-hmm. You know, one with the hand, and they, they never gave us two penalties against Brazil. So. <laughs> Well, we we ran them close, but that was a great that was a great occasion. A great, um, it was just a great game. It was just we just pulled up short, and that just seemed to be the sort of the thing about Scotland in ninety eight. They just fallen short, um, not quite getting it over the line. In that last game against Morocco, that mm. was something that kind of just summed up the whole tournament, wasn't it? It yeah. just wasn't to be for Scotland. No, it wasn't. I mean, never to be fair, we never performed in that game. We never played well. Um, I know Craig got sent off, but I don't think we played well in St. Etienne. We never, we never, I don't think we turned up against, so I think they, they beat us fair and square. The game against Norway, the second game, we absolutely battled Norway. We should have won. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, we absolutely ran over the top of them against the good Norway side, but the heat that day, they were, they, they were doing the with cram. They couldn't, and the, the atmosphere that night, or that day, was, was absolutely unbelievable in Bordeaux. The Norway game, we should have won Morocco, Norway. In my opinion, I don't think we deserve to win. Going back to that Norway game, there was a sort of contentious decision which almost decided whether Scotland would be going through to the next round or not. And it was the free kick awarded for the foul on Gordon Jury. Now, looking back on it now, if you'd VAR, that's given, that's a penalty, that's inside the box. Did yeah. that sort of spur the boys on to say, look, we're kind of playing against maybe more than 11 men here? No, at that time, at that time... I don't think we you, you took the decisions as what they were. We, you never really okay you'd have an argument with the FRE or linesman or whatever like line with the nails, but it, it, when you overstall it in okay, let's go to VR because it also wasn't wasn't in line at that time, but yeah, it's, but that's the era we played in. The era was VR wasn't there. This era VR checks if the if the wind's going in the right direction. So there's that many things VR and the rocks in my day it was we play okay mm-hmm. you don't have a decision but you take it in the chin and you, and you go again with it so obviously no one would have thought it would be 23 years before Scotland made it to a major tournament but coming away from that was just a case of right boys put this one behind us and concentrate on the next campaign yeah I, I mean you I think we, we I think we should have done better in the Euros I think in the Euros was the following tournament I think it was ourselves in Belgium. We were beating Belgium 2-0 at Hamden and they get one sent off and we're absolutely cruising against them. And then they, they, they pull it back to two each in the last minute, last last head of the ball. And then we have to go to Belgium and they beat us 2-0. And that was, that was a tournament I thought was 
Uh, that one, that one probably got away for us, but that game certainly hurt us in the Belgium game. Mm-hmm. And obviously, looking forward to this season's competition, this summer's competition. Do you think the boys have got a chance of getting out of that group? Uh, every, every game's tough when you play international, but I think looking at the team at the minute, it, 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 it's a really good, stable team, really solid. They all work for each other, which I think is really, really important. The big thing for me is not having the fans. If there's only a number of fans, you know, I don't know what the the rules are up in, up in Glasgow where they're going to let the I think it's 12,500 I think you can get in for the game 12,500 is it it's in a 50,000 seater stadium it's, it's better than nothing mm-hmm. like when you have a full Hamden that would be that would be brilliant for them you, you know to play they've, they've got to go to Wembley and there's only 22,000 in it or whatever it is 3,000 Scottish fans it's not the same but that's the world we live in at the minute we, we, you can't change that but I guess Having some fans in is, is better than nothing. Can can they go to the group? Yeah, they can. They can because I I think they're I think they're a, they're a decent side. Yeah, and we obviously everyone here at a state of mind wishes the Scotland team all the best for this summer's competition, um, and I'm sure we'll be covering it. So keep an eye on that one. Just going back, but to what was maybe your most successful time in terms of winning trophies and picking up medals it was your time at Celtic under Martin O'Neill when he came into the team it's almost very similar to the situation that Celtic finds himself in now they're looking to rebuild they're looking to sort of put this platform together for the next couple of years what influence did Martin have when he came into the club and did anyone really expect the success that he could bring? Well, I think the, the, the expected success at Celtic is, is always there every day. Every day the people expect you to win. And that's the demand of the club. Did anybody ever think that it would go as well as what it did? Nobody knew. We, we, we needed some delight. The gaffer to come in and take the club with stuff in the neck and, and drag it through. And he was, he was absolutely brilliant for us. We, we, we were terrible the year before. And um, we never been going at all the year before. We lose the league by twenty one points, which was, mm-hmm. which was unacceptable. And um, the gaffer came in with Wally and Robbo and turned it right on his head and kept kept the good players there and, and bung ones in to help us. And, and it, it just took off. We just we became strong. We became unbelievably quick. We became an incredible dressing room. The team spirit and, and the drive and the hunger. Was there and we, we were for for the years he, he was there. We, I thought we were excellent. And some people would say it's some of the best football that you played was under Martin O'Neill. You won the Football Writers Player of the Year in two thousand and two. You formed a really good partnership in the the heart of midfield alongside Neil Lennon. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> as difficult as this is for a lot of Celtic fans to kind of talk about, you went on to have the best European run that Celtics had probably since the 1970 um, mm. final, getting all the way to Seville and then just coming up short. Before we talk about the final, tell us about the build-up and the kind of run that you went on. Obviously, you scored against Stuttgart. Would that be your highlight of that kind of run? Uh, I, I just thought we were a really good side. I thought we were really strong. Whether we're ever going to be beat a Bayern or, or Dortmund or a UV. No, do ever know that, but we we took UV on in the Champions League and beat them at Parkhead. We took Bayern on that a draw. So anybody ever came to Parkhead was always going to find it difficult against mm-hmm. them because of the atmosphere and the team we had. The run we had was, I just think we had a great belief in us that it doesn't matter who comes to Parkhead, we're going to win. And I said, we doesn't matter who came there. Didn't matter what team came there, we had that belief that we were going to win. And the gaffer had that, we installed in that, and everybody where everybody would run through a wall for each other. And and that was gave us a platform of success where we had that and you had Henry who would score for us uh, nothing. And and it, it's, it's a great saying, you're only as good as your strikers. And Larson was one of the best. So when you look at Henry and the goals that he scored for us, and, and I'm talking Henry way back in Bim Janssen's time, Henry mm-hmm. had done it when, 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 when I first came back as well. So we had a striker who, who could score goals out of nothing uh, for us, but we had some really talented footballers that knew the game 
and, and with a manager that, that gave us the belief that we could obviously win every single game. You had that run all the way to Seville and you played Jose Mourinho's Porto in the final. Mm-hmm. A lot of players that have been interviewed since have said they've not actually watched the game back. Are you mm-hmm. in that camp? Have you seen it back? No, I've not watched it. No, no, no. no I'm not, I'm not, not watched it. And people always say, try and not have any regrets in football, but that's, that's, that's probably my biggest regret is not winning that. Because it was, it was arguably, and I know it's different eras and I would never compare my era with Celtic team against the, the, the current era or Gordon Sackin's era or Ronnie Dyla's era or anything like that but I think yeah if you look at my era it would be hard pushed to, for any day, day teams to play against us uh, that era I think we're only second to the Lisbon Lions mm-hmm. they're up there on a pedestal with ourselves but the Martin, Martin O'Neill era I think comes comes second people probably beg to differ with it but <laughs> That's just my opinion on it. And, I mean, it's a fantastic occasion. So many Celtic fans travelling mm-hmm. over to Seville, turning the city green and white. And you mentioned before you had the fantastic nights against Bayern Munich, against Juventus. A lot of people expected Celtic to kick on from then and to become one of the real powers of European football. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that is that it didn't happen? Finance. But it's easy. It's an easy question. The finances of Celtic... Had got the exact same finances as the big European hitters, uh, TV money, Sky money, it's no stopping it. It's no stopping it. And, and if Celtic ever got to the Premier League, which I don't know would ever happen, you give them a few years to find their feet, the finances the same, it's not going to be any bigger. I know that for a fact. Through experience, I know it for a fact. The club is massive. And, and you'd have to build another tier on the stadium to um, to compensate the amount of fans who'd like to come and watch it because it's a global club, but it's it's, it's an easy it's a, an easy question. The answer is, is finances. That's that's all it is. That's uh, different. If they're playing a different league and they finance everybody else, it's, uh, that's an easy question. When you look at it, then do you think that the side that you are a part of were overachieving, or do you just think that from that point on, it just got daft compared to money and football and the wages and the transfer fees just got to the level where Celtic couldn't keep up? No, I don't, I don't think we overachieved. I don't, I don't think that. We certainly never underachieved in that, that run. Mm-hmm. I think the, the, we just fell short in that, that final through yeah, one or two more reasons that, 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 that could have happened for us, but we we just fell short in that and, and but we were a hell of a side we were a hell of a side and I don't think I should ever under, underestimated we were a hell of a side and I don't think many too many teams would have liked to play against us Just a kind of retort a kind of theoretical one here even because you, you couldn't really do it but if you compared the Borussia Dortmund side that won the Champions League against that Seville side and you mm. played each other who do you think would have came out on top? <laughs> I thought, okay, here's a, here's a, a, a diplomatic. <laughs> if it was a two-legged affair, I think Dortmund would win. And, uh, if it was one-legged, the park gets Celtic won. If it was one-legged, then Dortmund, Dortmund would win. <laughs> so <laughs> the Dortmund team, was, as I said before, was, it was incredible. I, I think they, I played with two great, great teams, different from each other many aspects one was incredibly high in the highest league one of the highest leagues in Europe at that time in Bundesliga and won the highest honour one was playing in a country where it's no viewed as strong as any other countries like England or, or Germany or Italy mm-hmm. but the club is huge and the demand of it is huge and, and just falling short it's a really difficult one to answer the two two great clubs which are probably really honoured to play for and I'm sure there'll be some smart computer person out there that will try and put these two teams together for a, <laughs> a FIFA yeah. compilation of that but definitely tag us in the video if that's the case after the, the kind of disappointment of not winning the UEFA Cup mm. coming back to Celtic you kind of had a, a bit less of a more important role to play at the club you weren't playing as many games <laughs> was your eye already at that point into your next move and maybe into the coaching side of things yeah, because I was getting, I was getting nearly thirty-five, and uh, I knew, I knew that I didn't have much left. The biggest thing for football is admitting when you when you know your time's up, really. And I knew that, but I never, 
I never felt any ill feeling towards myself, thinking I want to play as long as I can. I didn't want to go down the levels and, and do that. I didn't want to not enjoy a sport that gave me great moments. So I, I knew my time was coming to an end. And, and, and um, actually, Steve Walford asked me, would I come into the coaching side of it and help the first team? And I, and I, I wasn't sure at the time because of that that meant I was leaving the guys that I played with to get into coaching and that sort of thing. But I helped at the under 15s. And it was Tommy Burns that actually said to me about it. And I went in with Danny Craney at the time and, and, and really enjoyed that with the kids at that time. I really enjoyed that that time. Uh, so I had my, probably one eye on that, that side at that time. But I knew, I knew my career, 20 years, an incredible, incredible career. So I knew. But I think that's, a, that's the hardest thing is for any footballer to say their time's come to an end and people remember you for what you were and not what you are. That, that, was, that was important. Uh, I've seen some videos out there and I remember being at a game, uh, I believe it was against Livingston, when the floodlights went out and up on the big screen at Celtic Park you used to get the sort of the trailer videos of what was on Celtic TV and I think it was uh, a day in the life of yourself and Henrik it was at the time the, yeah. the man over my shoulder here and one of the clips I always remember is the two of you having a sort of pool competition uh, <laughs> was that yeah. kind of was it maybe a pool career that was up on the tables uh, instead of a coaching career <laughs> every morning me and Henrik used to play pool every morning and um, I go that competitive that whoever lost had to make the coffee in the morning for, for each other and it became <laughs> it became unbelievable competitive and uh, Larson was absolute rubbish at pool right and then he, he got better and better the more he played it and all that and uh, honestly God they games they, be, they games became incredibly <laughs> every morning it was every morning we were probably in there about eight, half eight or something in the morning and we used to play that until uh, until we had to go and get changed for training and um, but that that's when it became competitive was whoever whoever lost made the coffee and whoever lost used to go away in a, a straw shut the door and, and the other one <laughs> two sugars sending away two sugars and you just hear them saying so so that, it became but that that's what, when you have a good spirit and you have a good team together that, these sort of things happen and who generally won was it yourself um, or was he, it Henrik he wasn't, there's no one spe- Swedish player that plays pool. <laughs> There's no, t- there's no chance. If Larson if phones you up and he says there is a Swedish player, then I, I need to know about it. But no, no way. There's no way he's beat me at pro. No chance. Oh, definitely. That was certainly something that um, caught my eye, especially as a youngster, idolising yeah. guys like yourselves and yeah. um, that that kind of camaraderie. It obviously helps build the team morale. But I mean, I guess if you're kind of playing maybe Rangers at the weekend on the Friday morning, don't want Henrik storming out. <laughs> so uh, did no, you kind of we, get it a wee bit easier on him then? Uh, no, we, we took it. It, it didn't become a, a real competitive. Uh, so it didn't. It was just a thought of making each other a coffee. Thing, I do I do I make him a coffee this morning? You know, <laughs> probably vice versa. I said when he got to the door, I would shout two sugars any for you, and he would do the same to me, and I'm good in that room. You know what I mean? So, but now we we had, we had some brilliant brilliant times. And then obviously you moved on and you finished your career at Livingston, and that's mm. where the coaching side of things came into. It. Um, you kind of how difficult is that that kind of final game when you just know. I'm not going to pull these boots on again. I'm not going to play professional football again. My, my career is now coming to an end. That must be one of the most difficult days in your life. Yeah, because you know when it's gone, it's never coming back. You know, mm. it's never it's never there. The, the mind sees it, but the legs can't take you there. And, um, and I think because of the standard that I did play and the things that I'd won, I never really wanted to drop the ball up. And um, I was always used to kind of winning trophies and medals I didn't want to drop below that and that's that was a big thing for me but once that's gone it's just never coming back to you don't, don't matter who you are it, it's one thing you never beats time mm-hmm. time always beats you as a footballer because you've only got a short span that you can you can play the game so uh, and that's where I say going back to your point earlier on about the mental health issues is what does a footballer do or, or a sports person when they, when they finish it and, uh, mid 30s so it's, it's really difficult really really difficult but I was fortunate I went into the other side of it 
And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very, very lucky. And I think everyone can agree that the kind of career after playing football has went almost as well as as it did on the park. Yeah. You've been introduced into the Norwich Hall of Fame after taking them up to the Premier League. You've been managing a couple of teams in the Premier League. Um, looking at it, you're you're only just past 50 now. You've yeah. managed over yeah. 600 games. You're still relatively young in terms of managers. Yeah. How long do you think you've still got in this and where do you think your next career move will be? I don't know how long you, you have in management with us. It's uh, Again, that's an open book, really. Um, we, I look at Roy Hodgson and people like that who, in his 70s and still going strong. It's incredible achievement. So I like Ferguson, Arsene Wenger. I've had some great meetings with Angelotti, Pep, Jürgen. Yeah, so I spoke to Antonio Conte. All great guys, managers in their own, their own right. Uh, Robert Schmidt when he was at Leverkusen. I'd, I'd been everywhere talking to the guys and seeing their views on football and I enjoyed that when I left Aston Villa I enjoyed going in Europe and, and seeing different managers and, and how they how they went about it and it opens your eyes because it's, a, it's an incredible thing when you go when I, when I was fortunate to go and say to meet Carlo Angelo in Madrid or Pep and Bayern at the time or Jürgen at Dortmund at the time so that in itself is an education on it, looking, going to see it. So regarding how long I'll do it for, no devil knows, I want to go back in, yeah. You really want to go back into it, because as, even though I'm just yeah, 51 at the minute, but I still want to go back into it and, and yeah, and get going again, yeah. Is that something you want to get back into immediately, or are you looking to take a bit of time out to kind of assess the situation at the minute? No, at the minute, I'm... I'm Easy at the minute because the season is nearly finished anyway. Whatever, whatever country you're in, the season is nearly finished. Maybe the next few months when it all starts to kick in again and hopefully lockdown eases a little bit more, you can start to travel and things like that, which, which will be nice. And then and hopefully get back in and hopefully it's, it's a good challenge. Whether or not this would be an option for you now, the Celtic job is currently available. I'm not saying that you'd be looking to take the job now, but if the opportunity was to come up in the future, is it something that would interest you? No, no. And, and the reason for that is because I'd, I'd eight, whether it was eight or nine unbelievable years there, when my life was was Glasgow, that was my life. And uh, I would never want to ruin that with, with, mm-hmm. with support with them. Um, I know what it's like. As a footballer, I don't know what it's like to manage or coach there, but I certainly know the pressure of winning things there. And I was fortunate to play in great sides that did win a lot of stuff there. So, would I want to ruin that? No. I, mean, I, I love going back. I've, I've only ever been back once in 16 years. And I've done, done that the other week against Rangers. So, uh, the, the only time I'll probably ever be back at the is, is uh, probably when, when I get an invite or maybe I can ask to go and watch a game or something like that. But, I wouldn't want to tarnish, tarnish what I had though. And what about potentially the Borussia Dortmund job if that was to ever come up? <laughs> no, that, that'd be that's in a way on another scale. Again, that, that is the same thing. I, I love the club and some great, unbelievable moments, great time there and everything that that, that somebody from Scotland could ever wish for what that club gave me. So, and Again, the support that I had for the fans. Uh, they, you always, very rarely do you get into a club and it ends brilliantly. Very, I, I don't know any managers would probably get that. Maybe Pep. Pep's probably the only one that's, that's uh, on top of that. Uh, uh, Jürgen. Uh, that's, that's a really unique thing, that, you know. But mm-hmm. and You never know where a manager will take you. you. You never ever know. But going back to Celtic and, and what I know of it and the way it was, as I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to ruin that. Well, I hope that we see you back in management very soon, Paul. I think you've got a lot to offer to the game um, and I'm sure there'll be a couple of opportunities that arise over the summer once clubs look at what they're going to do for next season. But over the summer, obviously Scotland will be playing in this major tournament, the Euro 2020, playing in 2021, which is confusing enough as yeah. it is. 
the boys that are going to be picked for the squad, they'll be looking to guys like yourself who are the last Scottish player players, sorry, to have ever played in such a major tournament. If any of them's listening right now, which we hope they are, what was the one piece of advice you would give them ahead of this summer? One. Win, win the games if you can and get through but you get through the, the, the rounds I think that's or the, or the group you enjoy it but you only enjoy it if you win that, that's what I was saying earlier on in the programme where you, the game's about winning professional sports about winning and the guys will enjoy it a hundred times more if they win they'll not enjoy it if they lose 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 that, that's not enjoyable people say oh we took part in the tournament <laughs> You just hope the mindset is we, we want to win. We 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 have a great time if we win. Scotland as a, as a country will have a great time. I mean, hopefully, I'll be Nico and uh, Glasgow, or Edinburgh, or Dundee have big screens in the in the squares and you can watch it. And I mean, if Scotland won, I mean, dear, dear, that'll be that'll be great. It'll not be so great if we lose. But that, again, that but that's just me. That's just my. My thing of winning is, is, is enjoy it when you, if you win, you enjoy it more. Well, we certainly do hope here at a state of mind that Scotland can boogie their way through that group. And Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the Football Insomnia today. If you are watching, do give us a like, subscribe to the channel. You'll see more content like this coming up. But Paul, thank you once again for joining us on the Football Insomniac. No problem. Thank you. 